This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. On today's episode, I'm going to cover water and sewer system. And specifically, I'm going to cover five key items to consider when evaluating your water and sewer systems for your mobile home park. We'll cover the types of systems, but then a couple key points that can help uh, protect your investment, help make you uh, better at due diligence, and just help better pre- prepare you for the long-term mobile home park operation. So, so first off, let's just go over what the type of systems are. Um, the ideal best water system is going to be your city water, but it's going to be city water direct build, meaning the city builds the tenant and the tenant pays them directly. You're not in the middle of it. The, the next best would be, you know, city water submetered. Typically, this is where value add strategies come, in, come into play, where, you know, you buy a park, Ma and Pa have been eating it on water for decades. You come in and you install submeters. And there's different types of submeters. We'll get into that. Uh, the next best water system is probably quasi-government water. And I don't hear this one talked about a bunch, but I've, I've owned these. And it's it's basically a government entity, but it's 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 not a city or a county. Typically, it's some sort of like tri-township or some, some, sometimes they're even privately owned. But they're quasi-government in that they are regulated by, you know, Missouri is regulated by the Public Service Commission, for example. And different water, and sometimes DNR regulates the Department of Natural Resources. Sometimes there's a state EPA, but or sometimes it really a, a combination of these. Uh, I don't like that as much city water because they tend to increase the rates faster because they're not elected, and it's there's a private profit motive. I actually knew a guy who who made millions owning the water system in Branson, Missouri, and. You know, good for him, but if he was my mobile home park water provider, he kind of had me over a barrel. Uh, now, there's some regulation, like I said, with the government approval, kind of like a utility company, like an electric and gas company. They don't get to just pick their rates, but they have limited competition, if you will. So it's not really um, a true capitalist water system. So that's quasi government water. Obviously, submetered is, is not as good as direct bill. Um, but, it, but I think both those are probably better than well water, which is your third water system. I mean, well water has some pros. One of the pros is the water's free. You know, there's, it's not free. You got chlorine. You got, you know, supervision. You got testing. You got reporting. You own a lot of the infrastructure. There's tanks. Um, if you've never had well water, some people are kind of scared of it from just drinking it. It, it sometimes has a discoloration, like a yellow or a brown. It sometimes has a different taste. I mean, it's pretty natural right out of the earth um, it doesn't have some some respect it's safer um to drink not as many chemicals and stuff um, in it but it's also not typically as has as much cleaning and purification if you will uh, it's generally considered to be inferior from a mobile home park owner operator standpoint it's also more work frankly um, it impacts the value of the park which i'll cover in the, the key points here in a minute uh, next up is sewer system um the, the best sewer is city sewer um, you know, I say direct build, but it's 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 typically billed with the water bill, and it's not really submetered, so it's not really the water. There's there's direct bill and there's submetered. Typically, sewer is a, either a flat charge or oftentimes it is a a charge that corresponds directly with water usage. Because in theory, if I you know open ten gallons of water down the tap, all ten is going down the drain. Obviously, it's not exact because you know I, I drink a glass of water, doesn't go down the drain. Um, it doesn't, if I go pee, in theory it does, but if I go pee at McDonald's later in the day, it doesn't go down the drain. So it's not an exact science, but that's how that's typical. That's ideal, at least city sewer. Uh, there's also sometimes there could be a quasi 
quasi government sewer, but really it would just be regulated, but it's really your private sewer. I mean, your private sewer, there's wastewater treatment plant, which is basically your a little packaging plant. You're basically your own little sewer, city sewer system. It's just, you know, your city. And sometimes there's a lift station because, you know, sewer does not run uphill. It's not pressurized, so sewer runs downhill. Well, if the connection to a major, major wastewater line, such as a city line, is higher in elevation than your park, you're going to have to put in a lift station. And those could cost a quick ten grand, but then by, by the time you get through some of the other processes with it and steps, it could cost considerably more. A wastewater treatment plant, it would, um, they work. Um, it just it's, it could be expensive, several hundred thousand dollars if you have to replace them. So definitely not for the faint of heart. So you definitely want to get those inspected by a third party professional during your due diligence. The next and third type of sewer system is your septic. Uh, it's basically the waste goes into a big tank, typically a concrete tank, and then it goes out into leach fields, and it kind of mother nature helps it aerate. I mean, it's underground, um, but it kind of evaporates and disintegrates into the earth um, through some lateral lines. And um, septic's not that scary. I mean, if it's failed, I recently bought a park where the septic had failed, so we actually got the seller to upgrade during our due diligence, so that worked out well for us. But um, septic systems are used, you know, in a lot of rural areas. I mean, even McMansion neighborhoods out in the country where city sewer is too far away. So I'm not, as af- I'm not quite as afraid of septic. The fourth sewer system that's uh, clearly the least desirable is the lagoon system. There's different types of lagoons. I think there's like a half a dozen or more types of lagoons. I mean, some of them are like a three-stage lagoon. I've owned that before. Kind of an aerator or bubbler lagoon that has uh, moving water. And then there's some natural spray lagoons and just other um, types of lagoon systems. Again, this is this is a little nastier because the waste is above the earth, kind of in a pond or sprayed onto the earth, almost like irrigation. And it's you know it has to be tested regularly. There's an expense to that. There's some downside from a, a regulatory standpoint and downside from a risk of a potential future government regulation. But that'll be a nice kind of segue into five key things. And there's some sub points here, but, you know, five key items to consider for water sewer. Um, the first, I you know, not that these are necessarily in priority order, but, you know, what's the material of the line system? The line of the system, I mean, in the, on the water, it's probably galvanized or PVC galvanized metal pipe uh, which is older you know, pvc is ideal um there's now pex which is even more ideal which is kind of like a flexible pipe uh, really makes it easy for uh, putting shark bites on there in order to stop water leaks or to uh, put shut off valves on or just you, it's almost like a hose where you can bend it it's harder to bend than a typical hose but uh, i've done it you can do it um and that makes it easier to Rather than shut off the water to the whole park, you can shut off the water to individual locations, well, frankly, by hand. Um, I mean, of course, I recommend getting a plumber, but come on, let's be honest. Who's going to hire a plumber when, it, you know, the average handyman can put a shut off valve on fairly easily? Um, for sewers, you know, the main systems, and back in the day, there was a lot of clay. So a lot of clay tile pipes are still out there. Clay is pretty good um, as far as overall durability, but the weakness is is it gets trade roots in it. So it's it's not that great overall. I mean, it, it's better than the other ones we'll cover, which are cast iron and Orangeburg. Uh, I'm looking, I'm under due diligence at the park in Orangeburg right now in Iowa, and I'm not that jazzed about it, the Orangeburg. But I've, I guess you're supposed to get it today. I didn't get my report. But the key thing, if you're, you're going to go with Orangeburg, is you'd want to get a third-party test. It'll probably cost you about 1000 bucks to scope the lines, and then they can identify if there's uh, holes, Orangeburg kind of collapses over time. Cast iron can kind of bubble up or create almost ovals in them um, because it just bends and wears and tears over time. But clay is, I'd say clay is superior to both of those. The downside, again, is because it's not as fit and tight as some other plumbing lines and sewer lines, it allows for tree roots to go find moisture and they find moisture in the, in the lines and then they eventually fill the lines. So you're going to be, Roto-Rooter is going to be your friend. We actually bought a couple of these, they're kind of like Roto-Rooter machines on steroids, but um, there's two, there's a couple different times. You have jetters, there's Roto-Rooters with um, a blade on it and there's another, which is kind of like a cable, almost like a snake. And then we got this new machine, I can't remember what it's called, I probably should look that up, but I'm kind of going on the fly here. Uh, but they're like three grand, so there's no picnic, but 
Um, those things just rip through. They're kind of dangerous to be very careful, but they, they just rip through sewer lines and uh, can cut up trees and stuff. And we just figured it was cheaper to buy those to kind of put them geographically uh, four hours or six hours apart. So we got them if we needed to because it's so much cheaper than hiring a plumber on a weekend for $400 an hour. We, though that machine's paid for itself already, so we've already bought another one recently. If you really care what it's called, you can send me an email and I get it to you. My dad bought them, so I don't even, I don't know what it's called. I forget. Uh, I've never used it. I just know you lose an arm. And the fourth sewer line, which is uh, far superior, is PPC. Um, typically, you know, Schedule 40. Um, I don't know. There might be some Schedule 80 out there. I've typically got the bluish green. I think that's 40. I think 80 is black, which is superior, but um, more expensive and less common. And there's, you can have a different girth of the line. I mean, typically like a four-inch line for the, the feeder lines. Your, your main coming in the city from the city will be more like eight inch or maybe six. Anyway, that's one of the key considerations. What's the material? The second key consideration during your due diligence is who's responsible for maintenance. Um, obviously, it can be a big one. Uh, we like to do preventative maintenance, things like camera the lines for problems during due diligence. Make sure there's heat tape and, and meter jackets. Meter jackets are basically glorified styrofoam coolers that go around a meter so they don't freeze uh, we like to put toilet stoppers little valve uh, replacement valves and stoppers inside the toilets we've been doing this man i don't know how many put in there hundreds of these things for our tenants even in tenant-owned homes for free because it doesn't do me any good to have my tenants spend all their disposable cash for the water company so we help them out um we like to install shutoff valves at each lot. Um, that way, if there is a leak, you can just shut off that one home as opposed to the whole park. And that's, that's, that helps. I, I know some people shut off the whole park every time there's a problem. That's a huge pain. And you can also waste a lot of water if you have, to, if you have fire hydrants that need to be emptied. But also, I envision little old lady, you know, shampooing her eyes and you turn the water off and she can't see and you didn't give her notice and she falls out of her tub, you know, breaks her hip and now you're getting sued. As opposed to putting notice on everybody's door, knocking on every door, saying, you know, tomorrow, noon to four, water's going to be off. Obviously, there are sometimes emergency, emergency situations, but I don't really think water's that much of an emergency. It's not like it's gas or electric. So even when we had frozen pipes this year, um, we just shut the water off to the whole park to fix a mainline break. We waited till tomorrow, you know, and we had just sucked it up. You know, I'm going to lose some money today on water, but I'm going to get the, my ducks in a row, my liability protection, my team. Uh, and so on other so that was preventative maintenance um that's not that expensive frankly the big expense is just repairs who's going to make the line repair who's going to re if you have to repipe that's massive there's the, uh if you have leaks you can do things like leak detection um we've had mixed results with that the problem with a lot of leak detection even with the pros is water tends to leak down i always was taught originally walk around and look for puddles that's where leaks are and that works to when it when it works and you know and we just we just had a, a key uh, find by one of our laborers in the field that like hey this is a leak and that saved us a lot of money so good for him good for us you got a bonus for it but a lot of times you can't see it because it goes down we had one park that it was a huge problem we probably i don't know ten thousand dollars we probably spent diagnosing and finding the problem and use several different leak detection companies where we found one that was competent. And they have like a stethoscope type machine. They they go around and listen to all the lines and um, listen to the earth. And uh, they had trouble finding it. And we had, to, we had to excavate, man, we had to excavate by hand because of the proximity of the homes, six foot by six foot by six foot holes, um, and like several of them. So it was uh, it was a lot of work. But repair of maintenance lines is, is massive massive risk um, so that's really going to go back to what's the materials um, plays in, that'll play in there it's your plan to do your long term capital expenditure budget alright next this is a big one how can I push the water sewer expense back to the tenants this is one of the you know blocking and tackling strategies for maximizing NOI maximizing, maximizing value of mobile home park and, and we and we do it every time too frankly we we sub meter that's how you do it. How do you push it back? You submeter. Some states there are restrictions on submetering. I'm not a well. I'd say there are actually are a few. I, I've I've not uh, operated in a state where it's illegal to submeter, but I believe there are a few. Um, it's somewhere I have a checklist that I can uh, pull together, but it's 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 dated. But I, there are there were some states that had made it illegal to bill back. The other question is, you know, can I bill back an admin fee? 
um, you know, if you go with a different, there's different ways to build back. You can um, build back. Well, let me say, there, when you sub meter, there's really two types of meter. There's a type of meter that are read manually. You know, you got your park reader or manager going around, sticking their head under the trailer, looking at the reading, and then calculating it from last month, and then coming up with some some ratio or some allotment to individually bill them based on actual usage. And the second type of meter is an automatic reader. It's what it's read by a computer uh, in some headquarters operation where they send you a regular report. Metron, for example, has reports like every five minutes. And the, the cool thing about the reports now is in addition to telling you where leaks are, they can tell you the temperature change. So they can sense when heat tape has failed. So it's, oh, it's 31 degrees. You better get after it. And that way you can avoid some major problems. So we're in the process of switching some of our portfolio into onto those automatic read uh, with temperature control uh, Metron meters. So check back for future episode on how, how that's worked we've been using their manual read um, which you know there, there's no fee um so that was that was ideal versus a regular monthly fee but most states you can bill back the admin fee so that's kind of the, the way to go and, and just in general i think it goes without saying but i'll say it why are we billing back billing back water sewer well frankly because it's it's like the largest expense. Sometimes property taxes, sometimes management, but water sewer is one of the largest expenses in a mobile home park operation. And if you bill it back to the tenants, what do you know? They all of a sudden care about how much water they're using. And they can get conservation. Uh, I bought a park here in Kansas City about three three or so years ago, and we submitted right away. And, and you have to, by the way, um, is it legal, is also to look at the, the, the timeline. So... You know, in Missouri, uh, it's 60 days for rent increase. Well, billing back water sewer is basically a rent increase. It's it's adding an expense. So some some statutes in some states spell that out as an indirect rent increase. Some don't, but I think it's saleable and colorable that it is an increase in rent in, indirectly because it's an ex- expense. So I wouldn't do it on day one. We give a notice of our new leases and do it along with our rent increase uh, after day 60 or day 30, day 90 for some states important to look at that on a state-by-state basis but in, in this one here in Kansas City we thought we must have had a broken meter because the first month we build this household there's three or four guys there any single guys no family no kids and they worked they were construction guys they went out of town a lot so they weren't around that much and they used 59,000 gallons the first month it was like a $2,500 water bill their home was worth like $3,000 and we, I was like, there's no way. And I called Metron. They're like, I was like, your, your machine's broken. They go, it can't be broken. And they, they bet me the farm on it. And what do you know? It wasn't bet. It wasn't broken. And what it was is these guys, they had four main breaks underneath their home. And they had a toilet that was overflowing. The tank of the toilet was overflowing so much, so continuously, that the water ran onto the floor. And it rotted away the floor the vinyl and the plywood and there was a ring around the toilet and the toilet was barely hanging along on the joist and they lived like that and I kid you not the water bill in that park went from $11,000 a month to $3,000 a month six months later and we went from 20 occupied to 40 occupied homes that's how drastic submarine water can be literally added $8,000 of savings per month to my park. Unbelievable. Um, so a huge fan of submetering. Uh, so key questions there, you know, is it legal? Uh, who can shut off the water service? The answer is you can't. That's a self-help eviction. It's a big no-no. But the benefit is of having the city be direct bill is they can shut off the, shut off the water. One, they're in the middle. They're the ones collecting. But two, they shut off the water service. And sometimes you can get the city to do that, even if you have a submeters. I'm getting close to getting the city to do that for me right now, or for one of my clients, and that'd be awesome because then it gives it makes the enforcement mechanism a lot better. And then another question with submeters is, can you push the expense back for private systems? I think that's going to be gray. Uh, I think in general, you're allowed to, um, you know, look at each specific state, but in general, you're allowed to recoup your your maintenance cost for things like your your testing, you know, for your well, your lagoon, your chlorine for your well, your your environmental engineer, your reporting, um, any sort of regular maintenance. Now, 
I've seen some guys, I've seen some PPM, not PPMs, I've seen some offering memorandums and, and pro formas lately where uh, some some sellers are currently billing back for reserves and infrastructure reserves. I mean, I'm talking like tens of thousands of dollars a year, and they're just adding it in as a make-believe admin fee. I think that's aggressive. Uh, I think it's frankly illegal and in many respects uh, unethical if it's not disclosed. But basically, you should not make money on your water sewer. Sometimes mom and pa will be like, oh, yeah, it's great. Lot rent's 200 but I also add on 60 for the water sewer. It's great. And I tell it, the water's only like 30 so I just it's just a profit center. Like, that's asking for trouble. That's asking for class action because you are now making profit on something that's a regulated industry, uh, like a utility provider. It's too easy to make money in this life and in this business. I wouldn't jack with that if I were you. Um, so anyway, that's number three. How can I push water sewer expense back to the tenants? Number four, you know, for private systems, is it log- logistically or financially feasible to hook into city services? Uh, this is especially important if you got a lagoon. I've seen wastewater treatments fail. Um, I've seen septics fail, but they can typically be rebuilt a little or at least reasonably expensive, reasonably inexpensively. But it's going to be a massive problem. Um, I know a guy, he's a broker here in Missouri. He's literally lost two parks because the Department of Natural Resources came in and said, you got to fix ABC or you're out. And it was the expense to fix the, the failing lagoon was greater than the value of the park. So he just let the park go and he just had land. He's like, oh, I got $10,000 of land now. Um, and I've also looked at some parks where the sellers put in $50,000 of remediation and, and updated systems, and, and that solves the problem, right? But the key is you gotta you got to look at that. I almost bought a park in my hometown one time. A nice park, but it was on Lagoon, kind of a bubbler system. And I did the math, and I, I called some engineers, and it was a $500,000 problem if I had to hook up city sewer. You know, and I just... I sleep pretty good, and man, it wasn't really worth it. You get a couple, one or two bad deals like that, you, you really mess up all the good deals before you. So you at least got to understand your risk, and there's a whole risk-reward analysis. Um, you know, Frank Roth talks about it a lot in this industry. I think he gets a lot of that from Sam Zell, and I'm a real big fan of that con- that concept of continual risk-reward analysis. And the fifth key item to consider for water sewer is how will private utility systems impact the value of my park? Now, i.e., is this going to in- increase my cap rate when I go over to refinance or sell? And I think the answer is absolutely it will. And I know I, some people will say, no, it depends on the market. And I'm, that's probably true to some degree. I mean, obviously, a 200-space park, all tenant-owned homes in Dallas-Fort Worth, people are going to still pay a premium, even if it's got a well. But I bet they'd pay even more of a premium if it had direct bill water, direct bill sewer, right? Um, in this example, we'll never know, right? Because you don't get the luxury of uh, hypotheticals very much. But if you look at enough sample size, you can see trends in the market where uh, even functioning private utility systems trade or sell at a higher cap rate, i.e. a lower valuation. So doesn't mean you can't do them. doesn't mean you shouldn't do them. I've tackled most of these systems. I'm um, about to tackle Orangeburg. I'm driving there on Saturday to look at it and going to get the report and stuff. That would be the, probably the only one I have not uh, really touched with and, and, and worked with in some capacity, either from a management or an ownership operation. Um, but you got to just know what you're, you got to know what you're getting into. And if you don't understand this, um, you can ask bankers. It's hard to get the bankers aren't that smart in large part on these matters. You can ask appraisers. It's kind of hard to get access to an appraiser that's, that's niche in this field. Um, brokers are probably going to be your best, uh, contact here. Uh, call the broker and say, look, here's, I've done this before. I'm buying this park and it's the one with the, with the failed, uh, treatment plan. This is a park in Pittsburgh, Kansas. You know, if it's and I gave them the stats. If it's got private sewer, is it an eight cap? Because uh, if it's public sewer, it's an eight cap. Private sewer, it's eight and a half, eight seven five. Well, I asked a couple other brokers, same thing. I started to get uh, a trend analysis, if you will, of fifty to hundred bips of pain. If it's fifty basis points, which is a point five increase in the cap raise of pain per private utility system, and up to a hundred bips for lagoon. So in general, I think you gotta you gotta 
you know, get a, if you're buying, get a discount of at least 50 bips per private utility relative to public utilities of similar size, character, quality in a similar market. So that's all for today. Uh, lots to learn, lots to evaluate, lots of risk, frankly, with the water sewer system. So as I like to tell my team, we need to get smart on this new system if we're going to run this thing. So till next time, take care, have fun. God bless. You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.